welcome everyone. Happy holidays. Uh, we think about you a lot during this incredibly stressful time. And because of the stress, we are going to bring you one of our favorite people who will become one of your favorite people. Dr. Jennifer Love is one of the physicians at Amen Clinics. She is a psychiatrist. She's uh, got a specialty in addiction medicine. So I send her a lot of our really tough patients. And timing is so good because right a now. brand new book, yeah. When Crisis Strikes, now When Crisis Strikes, um, she has been on the Dr. Phil show and the doctors. She was part of Mark Hyman's Broken Brain series. Uh, she's beautiful. She's smart. Uh, she's thoughtful and she just does a great job taking care of our patients at Amon Clinics. Yeah, this couldn't be a better time. I mean, you did obviously, Dr. Love did not know that we were going to be in a pandemic when you wrote this book. Um, mm -hmm. so that's so interesting. And addiction is just through the roof right now because of the stress of the pandemic. So, you know, kudos to you for just the timing of this, even though it was not planned. Not um, planned. It's been so surreal. Okay. So welcome to the Brain Warriors Way audience. These are brain warriors. What that means is they're armed, prepared, and aware to win the fight of their lives, which is for the health of their brain. Um, so tell us why you wrote this book. I mean, you know, as psychiatrists, we deal with people in crisis all the time. But right. what triggered it for you? So thinking about life, and I'm not going to say that I'm approaching middle age because obviously I'm 29, <laughs> but it, the older you get, when you go through life, things start piling up. You have parents who are ill. You start losing loved ones. Um, and you may have children with special needs or someone in the family with an addiction or you're involved in one of these horrible mass shootings, all these things. And I started thinking about this and I was talking to a colleague of mine who ends up being the co-author of this book. He's a clinical neuropsychologist in Norway. So we were talking about just life and all these things and, and how we deal with it. And we come from very different perspectives and training. And so we thought, well, how could we take what we do with our patients and kind of rearrange our tools in the toolbox, so to speak, to make what we do accessible mm -hmm. to people, but not overwhelming, but not too shallow. So how do you create a meaningful, in-depth approach to these serious life issues, but in a way where people can still tap into their humor, we can talk about our humanity, and it's not depressing. So that was the big challenge, but that's really how When Crisis Strikes was born. Well, and that's fantastic because, I mean, we, when people are suffering, if they're in crisis, you know, we're always recommending get professional help, but not everybody's going to do that. So to have this in their tool belt is, is really important to have these tools. If you're mm -hmm. just not in a position to see someone professionally is really important. Yeah, we spent months, we had these huge write on wipe off boards and we just went through like, how many steps does there need to be? You know, cause in my mind, it's so complicated because my mind, when I'm doing therapy with someone, I have a hundred things going on there and I'm thinking, you know, of all these different things and where it can go. So we just did right, right on board after right on board, really figuring out how many steps, how are we going to make this? We ended up doing five and, and the steps are all a finger of the hand. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the first step is get a grip. Um, and, and so we, it was really challenging, even just organizing the tools in the toolbox, let so alone writing the book. The pandemic. So we're in a historically stressful time. One of the most, and you know, I, I just remember when I was a child, we'd have air raid drills because we always worried the Soviet Union was going to nuke us. So we had to go. And I live in Southern yeah. California where there are earthquakes. Earthquake drills. Right. So, yeah. um, and then there was, you know, the civil 
rights riots in the 60s and Vietnam. And but but I don't remember a time that is just globally this stressful, yeah. probably not since World War II. And right. um, so when you say get a grip in the middle of a pandemic, tell us what you mean. Yeah. So we all know 2020 has been a parade of horribles, one right after the other. And we're just watching one crazy thing walk by us, you know, in our lives after another. And so the first step is really to understand what you're dealing with. So getting a grip is kind of like starting a little bit of excavation. So one, the problem itself is obvious. My kid is using drugs, or I think my marriage is ending or my partner has cancer, or, you know, fill in the blanks, financial ruin, lost my job, lost my company, whatever it is. That's the obvious. Then we look at the context. So I wrote this book without even knowing what would happen in 2020, obviously. So you have these horrible life chronic stressors in the middle of this parade of horrible. And we are all affected by what's going on. Mm -hmm. People are either worried or fearful or they're sick or they're angry. You know, there's very little room for neutrality in 2020, no matter who you are and what you believe. Very little room for neutrality. Um, but really, the context, getting a grip is about excavating a little bit deeper because we all have these internalized fossils that are packaged away that we know are part of our pasts, but have never felt part of our present before. Um, and these things get triggered. And so if I'm going through a crisis today of, let's say, a big financial loss. So 2020, um, my identity got stolen and someone filed taxes and stole my return. So, and then the IRS is closed and I'm, you know, working overtime, taking care of my patients. And it was just, you know, one of those things. Now I can be affected in a certain way, whereas someone watching your podcast may have a totally different response. So if when someone's young, they, their family loses their home or they have a big financial loss or they lose their security somehow, their house is broken into or something. That's going to affect how that individual responds to the taxes getting stolen or, you know, the current crisis that's in hand. And so we can have these responses that seem exaggerated to the people around us mm -hmm. because they can't see our fossils. They can't see what's going on. My favorite saying, I say it all the time, is if it's hysterical, it's historical. Mm. So we are allowed in big life crises to have big responses. But when my internal response is way up here and my crisis is big, it's here, but my response is off the charts, then I'm responding to more than just this crisis. Right. I'm responding to everything that's going on in COVID and everything that's happened in my past that is now my subconscious is, is being pulled up somehow and I don't realize it. So that's really, we walk people through that process of getting a grip on what's actually going on. So when you're hysterical, I'm it's historical. historical. Yes. <laughs> so it's um, like, so fabulous to I understand. Love it. Yeah. But I love what you're saying because we have, you know, um, so we have a situation just before quarantine. We became the legal guardians for our two nieces because of just addiction drama in my family. Addiction. Um, addiction. Yeah. And, and mental health challenges and stuff like that. So we have these two nieces who have been through just significant trauma for a long time. And then we have my daughter who we, I raised intentionally very differently than I was raised. And so she's had a very different upbringing than my nieces. So the pandemic hits and, and I'm hearing, this isn't just about me and us and our family. I read all of my comments on social media and I respond to them. And so I'm, I'm really responding for people who are listening too, because it's, I'm not alone. Like we're, we're pretty average. We're pretty normal. Um, well, I don't know about normal, but we're average. So my, 
Um, but the teenagers in our house responded and reacted extremely differently. So just like what you're saying, yes. my daughter, for my daughter, who's never really had something this significant, it was off the charts. And at first we were like, okay, she's acting a little spoiled. Like she's acting, well, what is going on right now? Like this is, she's making this very much about her, but we have enough training that we didn't say that out loud. <laughs> we just sort of stepped back and watched and tried to talk to her. My nieces who had been through so much trauma were like, eh. Like, eh, I mean, it could be worse. We've got a really, you know, a, a house with our own space and food and a TV and we're good. And so I'm like, okay, this is really fascinating to watch. It is. And for the young people, I think this has been a particularly difficult year simply because of where they are in their development stage. Right. So until we're in our mid twenties, um, you know, from kind of junior high on, we are peer driven. And our ideas and our beliefs and our personalities and everything, we are constantly sending out radar beams to our peers in that age group. And so when you take them out of school and take them away from that, they feel more lost. You know, I'm an introvert and I'm, you know, like I said, 29. So I'm past that, right? I'm happy being here. Me too. And I'm not bothered. I mean, I get lonely sometimes, but um, I'm not as bothered, but the younger people are a lot more because developmentally that peer group um, is more significant to them in their development than it is to me and my current life development. And don't you think part of it has to do, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, how much they've experienced in life. I mean, the older we are, we've experienced, we've had to work through things. So it's, it's, we have maybe a little more skilled than someone like a kid who feels like they've just lost everything. I mean, the great right. grief process for these teenagers who are, you know, school and social stuff and college yeah, is grief just is such, such a good word. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about two, three, four, and five on how to deal with crisis, but. Did you learn something? The thing I'm going to write down in post is if you're hysterical, it must mean it's historical. I love that. I'm going to steal that, Jennifer. Um, but write it down, post it on any of your social media sites and hashtag Brain Warriors Way uh, podcast. And also you can get Jennifer's new book, When Crisis Strikes, out December 29th. Uh, you can hashtag that too, or me. Hashtag when crisis strikes. Uh, you can get the book. It's going to be available at Target. How exciting mm -hmm. is that? But also barnesandnoble.com or Barnes and Noble stores if they're open. Um, Amazon, anywhere great books are sold. Jennifer works in our Costa Mesa Amen clinics, and we're just so proud of her. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. In the end of mental illness, I talk about, well, what if we reimagine mental health as brain health? And this one idea changes everything. Welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Jennifer Love. We are so proud of her. Um, her new book is out, When Crisis Strikes, could not be more time appropriate. And we're talking about, oh, excellent. Thank you for showing that. Um, we are talking about the five steps. So we talked about the first one, which is get a grip. What are the other steps, Dr. Love? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through them, maybe not as with as much depth, you know, so we're not here all day. I mean, it's, you know, a long book. Um, but as we go through, we walk people through. So we talked about how you get a grip and how you dig down and find out what's really going on. And then the second is the pointer finger and it's pinpoint what you can control mm. because the hardest thing about crisis is we hit this point where we feel out of control mm. and we are, it's like you're wheeled into the operating room. You're going under anesthesia. And even though I'm a doctor, I'm losing control. There is this aspect of things that's overwhelming feeling of helplessness that often comes along with these major life crises. And so the first thing our brain does is makes a whole list of all the things we have no control over because we're wired to kind of look at the alarms first. And so in step two, we train the brain to step back from the alarm 
of all the things we can't control and look at, well, what can we control? Mm -hmm. And then, well, what can we do about the things we can't control? Mm. And so it's not step two is not about making an enormous to-do list. It's teaching our brain that we have options. It's challenging that sense of helplessness to a duel. It's getting the brain off the siren and off onto possibility. So that's the process of, of step two. So we walk through um, how to do that um, in that step. That is so important. I, and I mean, for the people listening, I mean, not that I am a person who needs control, but for people listening, <laughs> when, when you, I love that you described that because, <laughs> okay, you can stop laughing. Now. When we feel out of control, I mean, I know for me, when I feel out of control, I start acting a little crazy trying to grasp control. So, mm -hmm. but I love what you said because that's, that's, so that's insightful. yes, no, I, it's, oh. It's so true. I mean, okay. I suffered for years with it silently with an eating disorder and it was all about control. It was all about trying to figure yes. out how to manage my anxiety and, you know, have this perfect facade. And it was so silly, but you know, silly is the word hard. It was painful. Um, mm -hmm. but one thing I learned in that process, and I love that you are, are talking about this is focus on what you can control, mm -hmm. focus on what you can control. But I love that you took it a step further and what can you do? about the things you can't control. That's just, yeah. I love that. So we have lots of examples in there too. When, uh, after the election, which I know was stressful for so many people, I was on CNN headline news and I talked about pest, post-election stress <laughs> trauma. And they, they cut it out, but I'm like, everybody should be saying the serenity prayer over and over and over again. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the right. courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. It is such a useful strategy. And I love that you put that number mm -hmm. two. Um, what's number three? Well, number three is a middle finger. <laughs> so I'm not going to not going to give you the middle finger, but in a sense, it's a finger of action. And so we, do, we give our crisis the middle finger. I love and that. So we talk about, you know, getting from all the options to how do you move into, into action? And my co-author, um, Dr. Hovick, um, is a specialist on the frontal lobe. And, um, you know, I have a section in there on motivation. How do we get motivated to do change? Um, long ago, I did a podcast called, why don't I want to do the things I want to do? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, cause I want to be fit and look right. good in my jeans, but what I really want to do is eat ice cream and watch Netflix on my couch. Right. right? We have these internal battles on, on doing the things that seem hard. So we talk about motivation. We talk about dividing up tasks into easy actions and tough actions. And so we walk people through the process of getting going. We help people find the fire in their belly to start fighting this crisis and to feel empowered to do that. Um, because it's something, you know, when I hit crisis, I want to like build a blanket for it and not come out for like a week. <laughs> right? So... Yeah. She so we give our crisis the middle finger. Yeah. She builds a pillow for since I was four. Night. And I think what was that protection? It, it was hiding. I, it was safer to hide. So when I was four, but I just, you know, now it's just a habit comfort thing. Um, but yeah, I love this hand analogy. I, oh <laughs> my gosh. No, I feel like I would be really good at giving crisis the middle finger. I think I could do that. It's, it's empowering. He's so zen. Often, yeah, but. he's so zen, but I'm not, I'm a fighter. So that's just, I like that. That's just, that's. Well, this is why we wrote this book together because we have different personalities and, and Dr. Hovick's so interesting. He used to be a PGA golf player. He's done coaching, um, psychological coaching for like the Norwegian ski jumpers, right. you know, but there are times in crisis when those of us who are soft, have to be loud and strong. And there are those of us who go through life loud and strong that will need to be soft. 
And that's actually step four. That's our ring finger, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is personal. Our ring finger is, um, it's a softness. It's not a finger of strength. We researched all the fingers, by the way, like really weird stuff online. Like if you had to have one finger get cut off, which would it be? Um, like all that <laughs> kind of weird stuff. And it's not, it's not your pinky, by the way. Everyone chooses pinky, and that's not right. <laughs> but the step four is called pull back. And it's a time of reflection and simplification. And we walk people through this process of now that you're doing all these things, your actions, what are, what do you want your focus to be on? What do you value? How do you put that in front of you? Um, Which relationships are healthy in your life and which are toxic? And, you know, what, how can you simplify your life without feeling guilty? What are the things you can do on a day-to-day basis? that are going to improve your life moving forward. And so this is a, what I consider a more introspective and gentle step. And some people, you know, struggle with this more than others. Um, but again, we just kind of walk you through that process um, and how to do that piece by piece, um, because you want to come out of this crisis a more kind of grounded you, you know, you want to kind of come away with that, knowing who you are, knowing what you value, because crisis distracts us from that. Yeah. Those alarms are sounding. We go into survival mode and we sometimes lose the essence of who we want to be or who we used to see ourselves being. He's, this is, he's so good at this. He's really good at like stopping and grounding. And I'm like always a fighter, but he's really good at like, so I've, I've, you've helped me learn some of that. And when I start to get a little over the top, like if he needs someone to like fight certain things, it's like, he's like, yeah, go ahead, honey. But when I need to ground, it's like, I, I know that that's a super vital, but we are so good together. We're so Mm -hmm. yin and yang. Um, and yet you, when you do need to fight, you just fight differently. Yeah. I remember in March when this whole thing happened and one of our young employees a covid and was on a ventilator six remember weeks. that six weeks on a ventilator and we had to close our manhattan clinic and everybody was freaking out and um i thought to myself am i going to be proud of how i act in september mm-hmm. that when you are th- in the crisis it's it's like get out of the moment and into all of the moments. Uh, It's just so helpful. So helpful. Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what's so interesting is people can do the steps individually. They can also do them as partners or even as a family. We have a lot of examples in the book. Um, So you can, you can do it together or alone or even with a therapist. Mm, I love that. And we come back, we're going to talk about step five and i have another thought on the ring finger uh as well that i want to talk about about because you know when i think of the ring finger i think of you right and i think of our family you know because i wear yeah, I my wedding felt, i instantly felt grateful for on yeah my ring finger and it's how do you activate your support networks mm. when you're in a crisis because often a crisis will bring out the worst yeah in the people you care about so anyways what did you learn um give crisis the middle finger love that <laughs> so many things i love that we're having this conversation with dr jennifer love who's a psychiatrist who has specialty in addiction medicine that we have to talk about her new book, When Crisis Strikes Out December 29th. Uh, You will love it. You will love her. She's uh, a master clinician and communicator. Mm -hmm. Uh, How can they find you online, Jennifer? So I'm on Instagram. At, uh, there's a lot of Jennifer loves, so it's a little complicated at, um, doctor underscore author underscore Jennifer underscore love. 
Awesome. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back. We are having so much fun. I hope you're enjoying this interview as much as we are. We're here with Dr. Jennifer Love, uh, one of the amazing psychiatrists at Amen Clinics, who's a specialty in addiction medicine. So we need to talk about mm -hmm. how this relates to addictions. Uh, her new book, When Crisis Strikes, out December 29th. You can pick it up at Target or Barnes and Noble or Amazon, anywhere great books are sold. So perfect timing. Summarize, Jennifer, the first four steps, and then let's talk about step five. Okay. So we went through the steps are the fingers. We learned how to get a grip on what the crisis is and how it affects us. Um, pinpoint what you can control and what you can't and what you can do about what you can't. Then we talked about giving crisis a middle finger um, and how to move into action. How do we motivate to make these changes in crisis? Very challenging. We talked about the ring finger and that is kind of pulling back in a time of reflection. The final step with the pinky, we call hold on and let go. Because that's what the pinky does, right? So actually half of the strength of the hand is in the pinky. Um, yeah. So step five is, um, a time to think about as you're coming through the crisis, what are the things that you value that you want to hold on to? And what are things you're going to let go of that don't serve you? Mm. So holding on to a healthy new habit you've picked up or holding on to, um, a new type of more positive rather than negative self-talk, talk. letting go of grudges, um, letting go of the need to control everything. Um, or, you know, so it, it can really be anything depending upon the crisis. So it, it's this process of, of going through and focusing on what we did in step four, um, pulling back and doing that evaluation and then deciding Here's what I'm going to live by. Here's who I am. And here's what I'm letting go of. I love that. So that, that is such an important point. And it's um, not an easy thing for someone like me to do. I know one thing that I started to do because I like to be, I, I'm an action person. I'm an action person. I'm a control person. So I know what I did. I like warrior talk. I fight. I'm like, I do martial arts. So I came up with this during the, during the pandemic, during the quarantine, I came up with this list these two lists in my head, wartime rules and peacetime rules, right? They change. So it's like, there's a difference in what we do and what we can focus on wartime, peacetime. And I think of just, it's just an analogy. Wartime rules mean we're fighting this pandemic right now. So that means that it's not so much that I have to give, like I'm being weak about the peacetime rules. It's that that's not going to be my focus right now. Like I'm just, I'm shifting focus, but it made me not feel like I was just like giving up all my control. <laughs> so. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody, but it's hard to let go of control sometimes. Mm -hmm. We we don't like change. Dr. Amon talks about this all the time. As humans, we are wired not to like change. Right. Um, and I kind of have a chapter in the book on the science of stress, which is a very gentle science. It's not like too scientific, um, but we are wired to not like change. And so um, people are very upset about the pandemic. Yeah. Um, they are upset about riots. They are upset about the holidays coming up and they are, uh, you know, because, you know, these travel advisories coming out and we can't go, you know, there's a lot of change mm -hmm. and it's hard to feel comfortable with global massive changes when we're wired for the opposite. Mm -hmm. We're wired that safety comes with consistency and even yeah. if it's a bad consistent, 
our brains will choose that oftentimes over a good change. That's why it's so hard to change, right? So true. Brains are lazy. Your brain does what you've taught it to do. Mm -hmm. And teaching it new things is hard, but that's where something so simple uh, like these five steps can just make a massive difference. Mm -hmm. Like get a grip, really step I back love these and assess. Steps. Um, and sometimes you get mad at me when I don't just react. I do, but then I'm happy about it. So when he, cause he'll do this thing. It's like, we'll be in the middle of something really big. And I'm like, we need to do something. And he's like, it's going to be fine. And I'm like, don't say that again. Like, seriously. <laughs> because you don't feel heard. No. Well, it's because I heard. just feel like we've got, yeah, I don't feel heard. And I feel like we need to do something. But then there's something about that. Like it takes me a minute, but that it's all going to be fine actually does start to resonate. Not that I'll tell him that, but it does start to resonate and it starts to give me peace. So we really do balance each other out. I just can't tell him that right up front. Well, I mean, it's really the difference between a psychiatrist and a neurosurgical. Yeah, do ICU something, nurse. stat, get it done. It's like, right. Somebody's going to die right. if move, you don't move, do something move. immediately. So that's wired into your brain. And for me, it's step back, assess what can I do? What can't I do? Mm -hmm. And sort of be okay with it because you know you're going to die at some point. So it can't be that bad. And for me, it's like fight to the end, so. <laughs> but it does resonate. So what you're saying is so true. And it, it does help to have that yin and yang. It does help. Well, and it's worked really well. And, you know, I mean, this year has been filled with so many crises for us. I mean, it started with, we realized with our nieces that their parents weren't good parents and they were just continuing to damage these kids and we needed to step in and they were so thoughtful that they allowed that to happen. It was an unselfish thing. But, but it clearly was a crisis and then mm -hmm. COVID and then my dad died. Oh, yeah. and, on uh, and on. And then, you know, so getting back to the fourth finger, to the ring finger, um, my dad died, which, you know, it's a cri crisis. He was married to my mother for 70 years. And then my mom's not okay. And she's coming off crisis after crisis. She broke her hip last November mm -hmm. and then got shingles in January and mm -hmm. then got, she got COVID too. And then she, we lost my dad. It just so stacked. boom, boom, boom. And mm -hmm. then, you know, someone I dearly loved was a great mother. All of a sudden thinks her children's trying to steal her money. <laughs> you know, and her, her children all have money. That's not what, but to just see someone change like that was so hurtful. So it just made us so unhappy and anxious yeah. that, you know, it's like get a grip, which, is, you know, step back and go, what's really going on, which was obviously grief. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, these steps as we're talking through is the first half of the book. Mm -hmm. The second oh. <laughs> half, there's a whole second half that talks about how to use the five steps in all of these situations. Mm. So we have these sections. So Daniel, you've had so much loss this year and we have a whole section on loss and we have a section on chronic illness and mm -hmm. we have a section on trauma and existential crises, the midlife crisis that I know nothing about <laughs> um, <laughs> spiritual crisis. Um, we have all of these. So we show people each section has these case examples of how people have used the five steps when they have a family member who's using substances. Mm -hmm. There's a section on family crisis. So while you, Dr. Amen, are going through, and I remember when your father died, and I just remember how devastating this whole year has been. Tana is going through that by proxy, right? Because she's your person. And so the family goes through all this together. And so Tana can work the steps mm -hmm. if when you're to just 
overwhelmed with everything that's going on. The steps can be worked by anyone in any context. So the whole second half of the book, we explain and show actually how that can happen. So important. And when we come back, what I want you to do is give us a couple of examples from your practice and from the book. The book is called When Crisis Strikes. Uh, It's out December 29th. Uh, You can get it at Target or Barnes & Noble or Amazon, anywhere great books are sold. And Jennifer works in our Mm -hmm. Costa Mesa, Southern California clinic and is just masterful in evaluating and treating our patients. Uh, How long have we worked? together now 10 years wow isn't that amazing um she actually trained at where tana trained at the loma linda university uh which we love loma linda because it's really a whole person medical and nursing i loved it education Uh, she also did a residency in hawaii so i love that part because that's where i did my child psychiatry fellowship Anyways, you're listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. At Aben Clinics, we're creating a revolution in psychiatry. All other medical specialists look at the organ they treat before they treat it, but most psychiatrists never look and end up guessing based on whatever symptoms you tell them. But how do you know unless you look? Brain Spect Imaging gives us a new way to look at your brain to understand and treat your symptoms so you can ultimately know what is going on and feel better. Welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Jennifer Love. We're talking about her new book, When Crisis Strikes. And I am just having so much fun with this. I love these steps and I love that they're on the hand because you just don't forget it. It just makes it so simple and so easy to remember. I you really guys, like the middle finger. I do. I love giving crisis the middle finger. I just, I have to tell you so far, it's my favorite step. <laughs> so, but they're all important. It just, um, but it just makes it so simple to actually grasp what you're trying to say. And I think this is so practical and so simple. So can you actually walk us through maybe a couple of examples of how this has worked with people you worked with in a clinical setting? Yeah. And actually, you know, it's interesting because COVID started after we had written the book, the publishers asked us to write our COVID stories Mm -hmm. and how we were using the five steps. So this first edition of the book has this postscript of our COVID diaries and, and um, Jill and I have done like a three-part webinar that will be shown through the Amy clinics. And at the end, we actually read our COVID stories and our step ones and what we did. And it was in that moment, I realized how vulnerable it is to write a book and all the, what was I thinking stuff started going on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. Oh man, that's hard now. I got really anxious. Yep. Um, the most challenging section for me to write was the section on loss. Mm. Um, and because it, it really hit home the, um, there's a, a story of a, a death of a sibling. Um, and it happens to take place over kind of Thanksgiving. So it's like, it's so apt for this time of year as, you know, families are getting together and there's that empty chair. And so there's a sister um, who has lost her brother and the kids. So they've been celebrating their holidays together for a really long time because when they were younger, their parents died. So as they got older and got married and had their kids, they were each other's family. And the kids all, you know, were running around and sisters in the kitchen and patients in the kitchen um, doing the turkey. And she's like, gosh, this is his job to do this. You know, she did the, the pies and the other things. And the kids were doing their usual running around, getting leaves and everything to decorate the table. And they really wanted to do this memorial for him and get his favorite football jersey 
and, you know, put it on his chair and, and have this celebration. And she was really struggling with that. And so I, I talk in that section about how, I mean, there's no like magic cure on the day of Thanksgiving to work through five steps in a day to like get through that. Um, but this time of year is particularly challenging um, for loss. And we have to start thinking about how can we creatively get through this time of year that's really hard. Um, I've been telling people, like, this is not the year to go through. Like, if you've lost someone, like, don't open your box of holiday ornaments Mm. under no circumstances. If you've been divorced or lost a spouse or had a family crisis, like, do something different this year. If you're worried about that spot on the Thanksgiving table, we're lucky, you know, in California, we have great weather, like load up everyone and go to the park, Mm. you know, do a bonfire, like give your brain a break from having to think. Um, A friend of mine years ago literally was carrying the Thanksgiving turkey to the table for his family and his elderly mother died right there. Oh my gosh. And it, I mean, I I don't have words for this kind of devastation. And the next year, as he was approaching the anniversary, he was like, you know, obviously freaking out. So he created a community Thanksgiving at Mm -hmm. his local church. And hundreds of people came and everyone brought food and they signed up for different things. And so he was in a different atmosphere, a different location with people who knew and understood Um, and could grieve with him, but also support him. And visually, he was in a different space. And so that can be really helpful as we're getting into the holidays, thinking about your, you know, we turn down the alarm that our brain is sensing around us the tension. One of the easiest ways is using our five senses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like candles and I arrange flowers and do, you know, I kind of make my own eye candy in my home. For some people, it may be, you know what? I just can't bear to go into that dining room for a formal meal this year. My eyes need something different. Um, And giving yourself the freedom to even give up traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was um, talking with someone yesterday about doing a, a tradition swap. So, you know, her family always did one thing on the holidays and they didn't feel like they could do it. And her friend was in the same position. So they decided to swap traditions. So they were doing something new, but each family knew they were carrying on someone else's tradition. And so it felt like they were still part of something, even though they, they weren't doing what they usually did. That's brilliant. Before we run out of time, let's talk about addiction and how this relates to, because, you know, I read one statistic where for every percentage point, unemployment goes up, that opiate addiction goes up three and a half percent. And so many people have lost their jobs, lost their businesses, lost loved ones. Um, what, What are you seeing as an addiction specialist? And what are some strategies people can use to not allow their addiction to get out of control? Yeah. So I'm seeing an increase in addiction um, where some people have to hide it because they're with families. Other people don't have to work so hard to hide it because they're alone. I see people who don't want to go into treatment because of COVID. But I think the biggest change I've seen is the increase and studies show this in daily drinking. So there was a study that was done at the beginning. I want to say somewhere around April, I'd have to look. Um, I I wrote about it in one of the clinic blogs. They they did a, a national survey looking at alcohol consumption for people who were working from home during work hours. Oh, They weren't even looking at at the nighttime. And we all know alcohol became the national joke. We had the quarantini, all the memes on social media. If you have a drinking (laughs) chain, you can't touch your (laughs) brain. 
and and people were zooming cocktail parties. Forty percent of people in California were drinking during work hours. Wow. And it was 50% in other states. Hawaii actually had the top 67%. But we're talking about masses of people. And, and I started asking my patients about their alcohol intake. And I just remember one day, maybe in August or so, um, I said to them, did you ever think that you would be a daily drinker for four to six months? And it's just like jaws drop, Right. Because that's the biggest change I'm seeing is people who have never had substance use disorders and technically may not have one, have increased alcohol or cannabis, you know, consumption, various things, because it's their escape mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, as both of you know, alcohol is a depressant. Mm -hmm. So it's the worst thing to have when you're stressed or or grieving. And it's, um, I talk about in the book how it's really a frenemy of sleep. People say they drink to like get sleep and knock out and everything. But the reality is as soon as your body starts metabolizing that alcohol, you get the opposite effect. So your brain goes into very shallow sleep. You toss and turn. You're not in the deep restorative sleep wave patterns when you use alcohol. And so, um, you know, the rise on daily drinking, I think, has been one of the trends that I've seen. Um, more this year than with my patients who have other addictions. I think there's been an increase in pornography um, and online gambling because people are just stuck at home, especially people without jobs. What do they do all day? They watch porn all day. So um, I think the behavioral eating disorders, you know, all of that stuff has really been a challenge for people this year. And access to treatment is a challenge because of COVID. So these tools, we talk about it. I think it's harder for people who are in the addiction to use the tools because their brains have been taken over by this dopamine problem. But for the family members and the loved ones, I think this is a great tool to help them organize um, their thoughts and feelings around what's going on in their family. Yeah. If you're a family member who is dealing with um, someone with addiction, it feels like a crisis to you. It like, is crisis. like, all the, like all the time. Yeah. It's, it's, right. it's nonstop you know surprises. It's, like it's nonstop. Up with it. Yeah. It's just, you can't, you never know what's going to happen next. And yeah. it's, you know, it's just, it's really hard. Well, we have, we love you and we love your new book. When crisis strikes, we're so proud of you for yeah, doing it's fantastic. this. Um, it's going to help so many people. Um, so whatever we can do to support it, we are going to do. Um, you can find Jennifer on Instagram at doctor underscore author underscore Jennifer underscore love. Yeah. Um, uh, to differentiate me between all the millions of Jennifer loves. Yeah. On <laughs> well, we're just so proud of you. You can get when crisis strikes at Target, at Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Anywhere great books are sold, um, get it and give it away to a lot of people because all of us are in a crisis and knowing how to deal with it better, mm-hmm. there are going to be less addictions, mm-hmm. there are going to be less divorces, there's mm-hmm. going to be less heartache and trouble. So thank you, my friend. Uh, Thank you so much, your encouragement, and you've been such a good mentor in terms of writing this book and um, teaching me the process of that. It's been two years I've been working on this book, so um, I really appreciate your support in that and having me on your podcasts. And yeah, and it's part of a line we're doing with Kensington Mm -hmm. uh, Publishers, which is we have a Naaman Clinics line and. Our friend Cabron Chapik did Concussion Rescue, which we love. And um, this is just, you know, another one of the great Amon Clinic books. So thank you, everyone. You have been listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amon Clinics, 
or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from Brain MD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.